So it's my great pleasure to introduce Jerome Gussmeyer. He is a distinguished professor in Indiana University where he's been uh, from 1997. He got his bachelor's at University of Cincinnati in 1973 and then PhD at University of South Carolina in 1979. He has been on the editorial boards of, of many journals, including Psych Review and Psych Bulletin. And more, more recently, he was the editor of the journal Diffusion. He's, he has received uh, funding from a number of agencies, including NSF, NIH, the Air Force. Um, and today, he's going to tell us about some of his more recent work on dynamic decision making. So, we, without further ado, Jerome, take it away. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, to, uh, today, I'm going to try to give you my story. Um, you know, my um, my uh, research life has been a little bit complicated. So early in my career, I did a lot of work on what we call random walk diffusion models of uh, of decision making. You know, these models describe the, the the deliberation process or the evidence accumulation process that leads up to a decision. But anyway, I you know later in my life, I had an enlightenment, and I started working on quantum models of cognition. <clears throat> Now, um, these quantum models are not quantum models like a quantum brain model. It's more like using the mathematics of quantum theory, but applying it to cognition. And actually, there's a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot of similarities between Markov models and quantum models, as I, I'm going to try to show you. But there's some important differences. <clears throat> but most recently, I've been happy because um, I've discovered I can put these two models together into one big model. Uh, the physicists actually have created this model. It's called the open systems model. It actually puts quantum models and Markov models together in one big model. So now I'm I'm happy again. I put my split personality back together again. So so let me tell you this story here. Uh, this is <clears throat> this is work I'm doing with my collaborators P Peter Kwam at University of Florida and Tim Plaskatch. He's now at University of Kansas. Now here's an example of um, evidence accumulation during decision making. You know, like if you're um, a pathologist and you're a radiologist or you're, you're looking at a, an MRI image of uh, some woman's breast and you're trying to decide if she has cancer or not, you know, you have to, you, you kind of have to, um, you know, look around and you're sampling information from this, this complicated display. And so you're trying to decide if a, a cancerous node is present. And so there's a, there's a sequential, seems like there's a sequential sampling and accumulation of evidence that's going on. And so the decision takes some time. And so that's this, that's an evidence accumulation process. And of course, the time it takes is important to the pathologist too, because they probably have a lot of images that they have to get done in a day. So there's a time pressure on these decisions as well. But that, anyway, that's kind of an example of an evidence accumulation process of decision making. Now there's also what we call um, value-based decision making or a preference accumulation process. And like here, like here, let's say you're trying to decide which motorcycle to buy. And so here you're not accumulating evidence, you're more accumulating evaluations. You're saying, well, you're looking at the style of the motorcycle, the speed of the motorcycle, and things like that. So you're accumulating evaluations in order to make a decision. Or, or the decision might be whether, you, whether or not you should even buy a motorcycle. I used, to, I used to own a motor, I used to ride a motorcycle for 20, 25 years, I got hit. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm okay now. <laughs> anyway, those are two, two types of, um, decision-making tasks, and, and these random walk models and diffusion models have been applied to both of these kinds of tasks. And we've recently been trying to apply what we call quantum dynamics to these two different types of tasks. So I'm gonna tell you about that story now. Now, what's the difference between a Markov model and a quantum model? <clears throat> now, this is a very simple diagram right here. We actually use models that are almost, you know, approximately a continuous state model but this is just a simple diagram to, to, to um, illustrate the ideas. And, and here's, so on the left, I have a kind of a typical Markov random walk model on the right, I have a, was supposed to illustrate a quantum random walk and a difference. Now, the idea of a random walk model, Markov random walk model, is that at each, at each moment in time, you're located someplace. So right now, like the decision maker is located at, at 30, you know, kind of leaning, to, leaning towards choosing whatever is on the left, left alternative, you know? And, and in the Markov model, you kind of, you jump around, you know, you move up and down these, 
these states and you it's it's a random walk because it's called a walk because you can only move the adjacent states you can't jump like a large distance so you're kind of drifting up and down this scale but you're always located someplace and so and markov models you're precisely located someplace and also it's, it's assumed in these models that you know your location now the information might come from the environment that you can't expect that that'll move you to a new location but at any moment in time you know where you're located because when you hit a let's say when you hit a boundary let's say this this top boundary if you hit this top if you finally drift up to this top boundary you decide okay i'm going to choose the option on the right so that's a and you have to know you're here to make that decision so you're 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 bouncing around and you're precisely located and you know where you are you might not know where you're going to move next because it's coming from the environment but you know where you're located now the word the way quantum walk works is different is you're not located anywhere so it's kind of it's called a dispersed state you know so there's some potential you have a potential for all these different states now the interesting thing about a, a, a this is called a superposition state and the interesting thing and i like this because i feel like psychologically we have these kind of indecisive states not not well not well located states so when you're in this state at a single moment in time there's some potential that you might give an answer like 70 that's above 50 or there's at the same moment in time there's some potential that you'll give an answer that's below 50 like 30 and so there's the, both answers are potential in the markov model if you're located here and you're asked you report 30 but here you're not located any place and if you're asked you kind of have to locate yourself and so this is called a dispersed superposition state and i kind of like this idea that that your preferences or your your evidence is kind of dislocated not well located now here's another diagram here so this horizontal axis is your evidence state different degrees of evidence let's say for left and right and this is time often we often we rotate this diagram but it's a little bit easier to make this diagram over here in this direction but anyway this is your degrees of evidence and this is time so you're starting out here neutral neutral degree of evidence and then you start collecting some evidence for the right and then you start collecting some evidence for the left and you're drifting around and so this is a markov model <clears throat> But the idea in a Markov model is you have a trajectory, like all classical dynamical systems, you have a trajectory. You're located at some point in time. You're kind of jumping around, getting bounced around, but at each moment in time you're located, so it, you, you produce a trajectory like this. Whereas a quantum model, it doesn't have a location, so you have a wave, so you're, dis, dis, you're dispersed across the states. So you might have a wave that's sit, starting here at, at, around neutral, and then this wave might be pushed to the right or might get start pushed to the left and so this wave is traveling across time so instead of having a trajectory you have this kind of dispersion that's a wave-like movement across time now in the markov model you know you you know where you're located any moment in time so if i stopped you at let's say so you're processing evidence and i stopped you at this point four seconds um, you would report an existing location so it would report let's say you know a 0.2 a 0.25 evidence because that's where you were located when you were asked so the measurement just records an existing location whereas in, in a quantum model you're not really located anywhere and so if i stop you at port 0.4 seconds you know right before 0.4 seconds you're kind of spread out i mean maybe you're leaning towards the right there, there's more potential for the right but you're not well located you're kind of dislocated but if i if i ask you to make an exact probability judgment let's say then i have to come out of i have to leave this dispersed state and report an exact answer and so i what happens is the measurement creates a location so in a quantum model you're, you're not located until a measurement takes place and the measurement creates a location rather than just recording an existing location so that's how these quantum models work i mean i think human beings are like that we're very sensitive to measurement so before the measurement you're kind of in this indecisive um dispersed um dislocated space but the measurement forces you into precision and changes your state now now when you talk about a markov model we, we're going to be talking about the probability you know the probability that you're located someplace so when you're so markov models are probabilistic models but the probability refers to an observer you know my as a theorist my my uncertainty about where you're located so you're making a decision 
I can't see inside your mind. I don't know where you're located. You know where you're located, but I don't. So the observers, this is like an ep what we call an epistemic uncertainty. It's the observer's uncertainty about a, a person's existing location. So the person has an existing location, but the observer doesn't know where it is. And so we put a probability that you're located here, or we put a probability that you're located here. So the, so the probabilities are coming from the observer. Whereas in a quantum model, the probability refers to an internal uncertainty. The person, him, him or herself, they're unsure about what answer they're gonna give. They don't, they're not really well located. And so if you ask them, before you ask them, they're not really well located. And so the probability comes from them trying to resolve the uncertainty and make a measurement, make a response. And so that's the difference in kind of a, that's what we call an ontic uncertainty. It's, it's an internal uncertainty as, as opposed to an observer's uncertainty. So that's how these models psychologically differ. And I kind of got attracted to these quantum ideas. Now, here's another illustration of these models. Now, the, the Markov model, you know, we're going to have a, a probability distribution. But this probability distribution reflects my uncertainty about where you're located. You know, so I think, well, there's some probability, most likely you're located at 50 at the beginning of the trial. This blue curve represents the initial probability distribution for the Markov model. And now let's suppose the evidence is pushing you to the right. So this is the, this is the probability that I think you're located in different places. And then the evidence starts pushing this distribution to the right. And if it's a reflect, well, this is, I'm using right here, I'm using reflecting bound Markov model because we have bounded scales of, we're, we're gonna be looking at bounded scales. But anyway, the part Markov model is gonna be, let's say the evidence is pushing you to the right, it's gonna pile up here. Now the Markov model, I like to think of it as like wind blowing sand. So this is a pile of sand right here. And then the wind starts blowing the sand and it's pushing this distribution over to the right. And then the wind piles the sand up into an equilibrium distribution. So that's how Markov mo models work. It's like wind blowing sand. And you, and you push to the right and you hit the wall and you pile up, sand piles up on the wall. Now the quantum models are different. Now this is, this is the, what we call the squared amplitudes, I'm going to, I'll, I'll have to make a distinction between, anyway, this is the probability distribution from a quantum model. Anyway, this is the probability distribution. So you're starting out like the Markov model, maybe with a distribution that's located at 50, but this is your own uncertainty. You're kind of spread out. You don't know where you're located. And uh, most likely the most potential is at 50, but you're kind of spread out, you're dislocated. And then the evidence is pushing this wave to the right. And then this wave moves to the right. Now, in a quantum model, the analogy is like wind blowing a water up against the wall. So wind's blowing this wave. And what happens in a quantum model, this water, this wave water, water of wave, hits this wall and it'll bounce off. And so it'll oscillate. It, now the wind will push it back, then it'll bounce off, and then it'll come back and it'll, so you get oscillation in a quantum model. Now, many, for many years, my Markov buddies, like Roger Ratcliffe or somebody, will make fun of that oscillation property. They think that that doesn't happen in evidence accumulation or preference accumulation. But we're, well, we're gonna investigate that later. So that's the difference between these models. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction now. Uh-oh, sorry, got a little bit lost here. I don't know how I did that. Okay, now this, is, this slide looks a little bit scary, but um, I'm not gonna go through the whole of this in detail. But what I wanna show you here is there's a lot of similarities between Markov processes and quantum processes. And I'm gonna just try to locate the critical difference. So it's not terribly important that you understand all this slide, but one of the things I wanna mention or try to get across to you is this. So a Markov model, this phi represents the probability that you're located in some state, like some state of evidence, the probability you're located in 30. So when a Markov model does, it, it produces a probability distribution across the states. So let's say if you had 100 states instead of the I think I just had like seven or nine. If you had a hundred states, more of a continuum, you might have a probability distribution across those hundred states. Whereas the quantum model, what it does is it puts an amplitude on each state. So instead of a probability, which is a number between zero and one, the quantum models, they use an amp, what's called an amplitude. Now, and an amplitude can be a complex number, but it's, it's squared modulus is less than one in magnitude. But anyway, the quantum models has a, an amplitude do, amplitude distribution across states. So this represents your dislocated diffuse state across the evidence scale. Now the squared amplitudes all have to sum up to one. So like in a, in a Markov model, the probability distribution adds up to one, the probabilities sum up to one, 
but in the quantum model, the squared amplitudes sum up to one. So it's kind of a different norm. The norm here is a like an L1 norm, and this is like an L2 norm. Now the Markov models, the way they uh, what the way they move this probability distribution, evolve it, they use a transition matrix. So this a, a transition operator. So this transition operator kind of moves those distributions that we were talking about. Are we okay here? Okay. Uh, you know, kind of moves. This is what's moving the, the distribution over, over time. Whereas the um, the quantum model, it has something called a unitary operator that corresponds to the transition operator. And so this this unitary operator, it moves the amplitude distributions over time. It actually rotates them. It's a rotation operator. And then finally, the probability for your Markov model is you you take all the states that are associated with an answer and you sum up the probabilities of the states associated with an answer. Whereas in a quantum model, what you do is you square the amplitudes, you get the squared amplitude, and then you sum up all the squared amplitudes associated with an answer. So you, you can So you can see, somebody's talking in the background. Anyway, so you can see that um, there's a lot of similarities here, but the main difference is the quantum models are, <clears throat> The quantum models operate. Rick, I think your microphone's on there. Yeah. <clears throat> the quantum model is operating on probabilities. I mean, sorry, the Markov model is operating on probabilities. The quantum model operates on amplitudes. At the end, you sum up the probabilities, but the squaring is produces a nonlinearity in, in the quantum models that you don't get in the Markov models that produces a, a big difference in how that models operate. Okay, let me take a look at some evidence why we started thinking about these quantum models for um, evidence and preference evolution. So this is a paper that we published in PNAS uh, several years ago, 2015. So we did this task. So this is a dot motion task. So this dot motion task is kind of popular in neuroscience and cognitive science. <clears throat> so, you know, you, the basic idea is um, <clears throat> you see these dots jiggling around and on a screen, and they're kind of jiggling around at random, but some proportion of them are jiggling in a certain direction. Let's say some proportion are jiggling to the right. The proportion that are, that are jiggling in a certain direction systematically is called the coherence. Anyway, so your job is you stare at the screen at the, these dots jiggling around, and then you have to decide are they, jig, are they jiggling mostly to the left or mostly to the right? Now, and, and what we can also do then is like, you know, you watch the dots jiggling around, you decide if they're moving to the left or to the right, but then we can allow you to continue watching those dots jiggling around then, and ask you to rate the probability later on. What's the probability that they're moving to the left or to the right? So, we're, so we can get a choice followed by a probability rating, this, this path here. But in this experiment, then we want to compare a choice followed by a probability rating to another condition where you just made it just made a probability rating. There's no choice. So you see the dots jiggling around. And at the, at the point in time that you, you would have made a choice, you don't make a choice. You just push a pre-program pre pre button. So there's no decision making here. You're just still watching the dots jiggling around. And then you continue watching the dots jiggling around. And then you make a probability rating. So, so we got these two conditions, a single rating condition down here, where you just watch the dots jiggling around until you make a probability rating. And then we have the double condition here where you make a choice and then make a probability rating. And so this allows us this allows us to study what we call interference, interference effects. This is kind of like a in quantum theory, a two-slit experiment, if you're if you know anything about quantum physics. Um, now the critical thing that we want to do is we want to look at the marginal probability rating that you give at the end. Now, if you make a choice and you say it's to the right, you know, then you're going to have a probability have, well, you're going to have a, like a distribution of ratings that's on the right side. But if you make a choice and you say it's on the left, you're going to get a distribution of ratings on the left side. But what we're interested in is pulling those two dis distributions. So once you, we're going to look at the pull distribution, the marginal, pulled across the choices, like averaged across the two choices. And so then you'll get a distribution, a single distribution. Yes. Oh, hey. you Ooh. see it now? Okay. We Thank goodness. It. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, anyway, you see these dots jiggling around. And in and, and this path here, this is the choice followed by probability rating. You see the dots jiggling around. You decide if they're going left or right. You make a decision. 
you see the dots jiggling around some more, and then you make a probability rating. Where in this condition, you, you just make a, a probability rating. There's no choice. You see the dots jiggling around. At the same time, when you would have made a choice, you just click a button just to control for the motor response. Anyway, so you see, you're just watching the dots jiggling around the whole time, and then you make a probability rating. So we want to compare the single condition where you, this bottom panel where you only make a probability rating to double condition. Now, we're interested only in the marginal probability. So what's the, you know, when you pull across the choices, you know, average across the choices, what's the marginal probability distribution across the, the probability ratings? And compare that to the marginal distribution here. Now, the thing about a Markov model is it satisfies something called the chapman kamalgroff equation. So it's, it satisfies like a total probability. So it says like, let's say this left-hand side represents the, the no choice case where you just make a probability rating. This is the marginal distribution of probability ratings under no choice. On the right here, we have the total probability where you made a choice, but we're, we're pulling across the choices. So this is the probability that you made a particular choice. Then this is the probability of a probability rating given a choice, and we're summing across those. And so the Markov models says that these two things have to be equal. And um, so that's from the chapman kamalgroff equation. That's from the, yeah, anyway. So the Markov model predicts no difference between the single condition and the double condition, no interference effect. Now the quantum model predicts that they're not gonna be the same. And the reason why this happens is the Markov model, when you calculate the probability, you're just summing the probabilities. Everything stays linear. But in the quantum model, you're, you're, you're summing up amplitudes, but then you gotta square the amplitudes. And when you square a sum, you get these cross product terms, and that gives you this interference effect. So we predict interference with the quantum model, but no interference with the Markov model. Now this is one subject. So this is this horizontal axis is the pro different confidence ratings, we call it confidence ratings, but probability judgments. It's like here's a 50% a 50 probability judgment. Here's a 70% probability judgment. So these are the different probability judgments. In this example, the, the evidence is pushing you to the right. This is the relative frequency of, of giving a probability judgment. So you can see that like um, in this choice condition right here, the relative frequency of giving a really high, rel relatively high probability judgment, the relative fre frequency is pretty large. And same thing for the no choice here. This is the choice and no choice. But what you can see here is the data is the blue line here you can see there's a big interference effect. The choice you know, is producing this big bump right here in the middle, and there's no bump right here. And so we get this kind of interference effect going on produced by the choice that the Markov model cannot predict. Also, the quantum model kind of captures this wave property of the probability ratings, whereas the Markov model produces this monotonically decreasing uh, probability distribution. And this is like, this is represents this wave, I mean, this represents this pile of sand building up to the equilibrium distribution, or this, the, the dotted, this dashed curve here of the, of the quantum model reflects this water wave hitting the, the boundary and, and kind of, um, you know, sloshing around. It can hit the lower boundary and slosh back, and it can hit the top boundary and slosh back. So that's, that's this, anyway, the main thing is we're getting this interference effect that's predicted by the quantum model, not predicted by the Markov model. And we also did a quantitative comparison of these models and use a, a Bayes factor to compare the models for the individuals. And we found seven out of nine individuals of the Bayes factor favored the quantum model over the Markov model. So this is the first kind of nice strong piece of evidence that we had for the quantum dynamics over the Markov dynamics. Now, this is another study. I'll try to go for briefly because I don't want to run out of time. We were delayed a little bit, but um, we did a second study a similar kind of study where, but instead of making a, a choice and a response, you see the dots jiggling around and then you make a probability rating at time one, then you continue seeing the dots jiggling around and you make a probability rating at time two. So you're making two probability ratings at two different times. And we have three conditions. In one condition, you know, and you made a probability rating at 0.5 seconds and at 1.5 seconds. So we get a probability rating here and a probability rating here. And another condition, you made a rating at 1.5 seconds and 2.5 seconds. And we get those two ratings. Those. And then in the third condition, you get a, a rating at 0.5 seconds and 2.5 seconds. And so the, 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 the critical thing that we want to do in this experiment is we want to do a quantitative test of the two models. So we fit the Markov model and the quantum model 
to the first two conditions. Like these are calibration stages. And so, and but then we're using the third stage is the generalization test. We're trying to see whether or not, you know, the parameters estimated from the first two stages, how well can they predict then, you know, using same parameters. We use, we fit the parameters in the first two stages, and we use those same parameters to predict performance in the third stage. And so that provided a quantitative test of these two models. Each model had what you might think of as two, two parameters, two key parameters, a drift and a diffusion parameter uh, for each uh, like coherence condition. And, um, and we estimated the parameters by maximum likelihood. And, um, and I'm just gonna summarize the results here so we don't run out of time because I, I got one other study I have to show you. And basically what we find here in this experiment is that the quantum model, this is, these are G squares. So we're getting a, a G squares lack of fit. So I'm getting a G squared lack of fit and this is for the generalization test. G squared lack of fit on the generalization test for the quantum model versus the Markov model versus the quantum model. And you can see the G squared, if it's positive, that means, you know, because this is lack of fit, that if it's positive, the quant we favor the quantum model over the Markov model. And you can see the G squares are definitely favoring the quantum model, except there's something interesting here. As the coherence increases, the Markov model starts, starts doing better. In fact, you know, in other, some other analyses that we've done, we find that you can actually build a Markov model that outperforms the quantum model at the high coherence levels, but the quantum model outperforms at the low coherence levels. So this started making us think that actually, you know, like when the, when the evidence gets really strong and you get like pretty consistent, really high probability ratings and low probability ratings, the Markov model works better. But when you have like a lot of uncertainty, the quantum model works better. So we're, we sort of started thinking that we, we really need both of these models. So now let me turn to this um, uh, summary here. We, both the quantum models predict these interference effects and the, and the Markov models do not. You could, you could add ad hoc assumptions, but we tried to rule out a lot of these ad hoc assumptions in our papers. Um, and we found interference for these effects, which kind of gives us support for this um, quantum model. And we found evidence for the quantum model in this generalization test. But we did find some evidence that the Markov model starts working better at the higher coherence levels. So now I'm going to talk about this most recent study. This is the most, this is a really interesting study, I think. <laughs> Hope everybody's still with me. Okay, you can see my pointer? Yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> we did two experiments. Let me just talk about one of them. So this first experiment, you were given coupons. These are real coupons. You could choose like a coupon that's got more money for, for a restaurant that's got a certain rating and um, a certain distance away from your home. So here's one coupon and then here's another coupon. And so you had to make a choice between these two and, and also a preference rating. So, but basically what we did is we, we turn on the display and show the, the, cho the choice between the coupons. Now we had different coupons, so this is just one example, but we had a you know, variety of different coupons that we're looking at, but this is one coupon here. But we turn on the coupon and they're looking at the coupon. And so they, they studied this coupon for five seconds. And then at time T1, um, we asked them to either make a choice, like we talked about before, where they had to decide which coupon do you want? Do you want the one on the left or do you want the one on the right? That was one condition. But the other condition, they didn't make any choice, they just pushed a button. So the second condition, they're just looking at the coupon and still thinking about the coupon. And then finally we had them make a preference rating. So they made a preference rating, like how, if, they're, if they move on the arc to the right, they're strongly preferring the coupon on the right, or they can move to the left and strongly prefer the coupon on the left. So, so we can study interference effects again. We can compare, we're gonna compare the marginal distribution right here, whether you made a choice or you didn't make a choice. And as before, the Markov model predicts um, no effect of choice versus no choice on the marginal distribution, whereas the quantum model predicts an effect. But, the, but another thing that the quantum model predicts that I mentioned at the, early, at the beginning of this talk, so is the quantum model predicts oscillation. And so we looked at the we looked at this preference rating at different points in time. Here's a like like here's a choice at after five seconds, but then three seconds later, or six seconds later, nine seconds, eighteen, thirty, and forty-five seconds later, we asked for this preference rating. So we're or we want to see is there any kind of oscillation going on in between during these periods of time? And people have never really they like people like Roger. I make fun of Roger, but uh, he's a friend of mine. But you know they always made fun of the fact that they, the quantum model predicts oscillation, but they never tested it. So we tested it. And what we find is we do get oscillation. Now this, this figure is a little bit busy because I got predictions on here. But um, 
this top panel is for the ex first experiment. And um, these blue these blue crosses represent um, the no choice condition. And the, and, the, and the red pluses represent the choice condition. And what you can see is both of them are giving oscillation. The blue crosses are giving oscillation and the red pluses are also giving oscillation. This is systematic. I mean, so in other words, this oscillation was systematic across all the subjects or else if it was, if it was oscillating different for different subjects, we would average out to nothing. But we got you know, statistically significant and also we did Bayesian analysis, confidence, that we get it, we're getting some oscillation right here. So first of all, we're getting oscillation that the quantum model predicts. The Markov model does not predict that. Like here are, here are the predictions. This is the best fitting Markov model. It just grows monotonically. Like Roger thinks everything should grow monotonically. I make fun of Roger. Don't tell him this. But um, anyway, this is the Markov model predictions. It's monotonic. These, these, these lines here are the quantum model predictions. Now, so the quantum model is predicting this oscillation. Also though, the quantum model is predicting dampened oscillation. There's a choice effect that the red pluses are choice. The oscillation has been dampened by the choice. And the no choice has a wider envelope. I mean, it's, it's sweeping out wider. So we predicted, so the quantum model, oops, sorry about that. The quantum model actually predicts that the choice is gonna dampen the oscillation and we get that effect. Now, the only thing is, this is the, this is the pure Markov model predictions, these lines right here. This is a pure quantum model predictions and it's kind of off. And so what we discovered is, well, we discovered is what these open systems models that I'm gonna briefly describe next. And the, the trouble is that the, the quantum, the Markov models are bad because they have no oscillation. They just have monotonic growth. Now the, mark, the quantum models are a little bit problematic because they predict oscillation, but you know, what we find is often is that the, we get oscillation, but the oscillation tends to dampen out eventually. It doesn't keep oscillating forever, whereas the quantum model will. And so what we developed now, what well, we were borrowed from physics actually, it's what we call an open systems model. The open systems model produces oscillation like a quantum model at the beginning, but then it starts to dampen out and act like a Markov model. And we also get this choice, choice versus no choice difference in the open systems model. So that's, that's the model that we're working with now. We're really happy because now we can put these two things together. Now this slide is pretty complicated and I'm not gonna try to explain all of this to you, but I'm just trying to show you maybe kind of briefly how this works so that this whole thing's really kind of real. You know? Anyway, and this is this is an open system quantum model. This is what actually they use in quantum computing, actually these models, because they're, they, when they're trying to dampen, when they have to worry about quantum noise dampening the system. Anyway, this is called a density matrix. It's a matrix. Now, the, the interesting thing about this matrix though, this is representing the state of evidence, this matrix. And the reason why a matrix is interesting is the diagonal entries can represent classical kind of probabilities, but the off diagonals represent the uh, quantum, what we call the quantum coherence. So you've got the quantum nature in the off diagonals and you have the classical on the diagonals of this density matrix. And then this part of the um, open systems model, this is, the, your, this is what we call your Schrodinger equation in a density matrix form. So this, this is giving you the quantum dynamics. And then over here, these are called Lindblad operators. But anyway, these are giving the Markov dynamics. And so we get, we're get getting qu quantum dynamics and Markov dynamics combined in one complete model. And we have a parameter, weight parameter can adjust how important each one is. This comes from physics. And um, what this model does then, it happened, the way this model works is that early on in time, this quantum regime is operating and, and, and dominating the system. But later on in time, the, the the quantum the Markov part of the system starts dominating. So you you get early oscillation, but then it dampens out, converges to the Markov model. So you're getting both systems in one dynamic. And so we re, we're really excited about this model. So and this model captures the um, epistemic Markov kind of uncertainty on the diagonal, and it captures the um, the ontic uncertainty in the off diagonals. And so we capture both kinds of uncertainties in these models. Jerome, just a, so, a quick yeah. clarification question yeah. with that. Yeah. The superscript dagger there, is that the conjugate transpose? Yes, that's the conjugate oh. transpose. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, yeah, it, yeah. I don't want to go through all the details of this equation. It's a little bit complicated. And it's yeah, it's fine. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a conjugate transpose. Yes, thank you. And that's, it's down here too again. This is how we, 
how we form the density. Th like this vector, this is a vector right here. This is a vector of amplitude distribution. And then this is its conjugate transpose. And the, this outer product forms a density matrix. That's how we form the density matrix. Well, I'm probably getting close to the end of time here, I suppose, aren't I? How am I doing on time? Let's see. You have a little bit more time. It's 41. Oh, Another 10 minutes, sorry. maybe. I really sped, sped through this thing, didn't I? Can't believe it. Well, time for questions. <laughs> I thought I was going to run out of time because of the screen problems we had. Did I get, I, maybe I went too fast. Well, anyway, so the conclusions are. Well, the Markov models, they have a strong track record for predicting choice and response time in past research. But, but, we're, but we've been accumulating some empirical evidence that, that the Markov models are not the complete story. You know, that's, that's these interference effects that we found and these oscill now these oscillation effects that we're finding. So we think there's, you know, the Markov models, they're not the complete story. There's, there's something like quantum dynamics going on in there too. Now, and so now with this open systems model, it's not necessary to choose one versus the other because the model provides an elegant integration and including a parameter that describes the, comp the contribution of each type of dynamic. So these models, you know, they're not really, they don't have to compete with each other. We, what we have is like a super model that incorporates them both, a, a unified theory if you want. And, um, and so we, we think that the evidence accumulation and preference accumulation seems to have both kinds of uncertainties. This ontic uncertainty, which, which reflects the uncertainty about the state of the system. And then, I'm sorry, ep, I'm sorry, epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty, this uncertainty about the state of the system. And the ontic uncertainty is the in, internal uncertainty about the decision maker, his, his dispersed and indecisive state. And so this open system model captures both, like the epistemic, as I said, is on the diagonal of this density matrix and the ontic ends in the off diagonals. So we're, we're, we think this, this is a really exciting new de development. And, um, and so that, that's the end of my story then. <laughs> I hope I didn't go too, I felt like maybe I was gonna run out of time, so I started speeding up a lot. Anyway, thank you for your attention. And I'll answer questions at this point. Wonderful, thank you so much. Give some applause from everybody in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about the pointer problems. Yeah. No, no worries at all. Yeah. All right. Um, if you have questions, you can just unmute and ask them, or you can uh, put them in the chat. Um, I, I have a question. Okay. I suppose I'll Go turn ahead. on my camera here. Um, so I, I'm curious. Did you choose a quantum model so that you could, <clears throat> how do I say this? So, so why did you choose a quantum model over like a, con a, a control systems model where you have transient and steady states? I'm sorry about this. Um, you can have a, um, you can have a, a, a classical de deterministic dynamic model, for example, but well, you so know, even the, those, quantum... the, the, the reason why we like a quantum model, let's say, is because why would, if it's a classical di dynamic, let's say nonlinear oscillating deterministic model, why would the, ch the choice versus no choice, why would you get interference? You'd have, to, you'd have to make up some story about why the choice is now producing the interference effect. So the interference effect is, is critical for, you know, and, and we also get this kind of dampening effect in the oscillation. You can have a nonlinear dynamic model that oscillates, but that nonlinear dynamic model doesn't a priori predict any kind of dampening produced by the choice. I, so I mean, that would, uh, that would affect it. That would depend on the state vectors and how they are controlled, right? Like well, what's I mean, the... you'd ha Yeah, you'd have to make something up. I mean, you can make something up. Now, we, and, 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 we, and, and it, when you make something up, then you'd have to go back and see how well it accounts for some of our findings. So when we published the PNAS paper, we made up six, like, I don't know, maybe, I can't remember, maybe 17 ways you could do that, 17. And we ruled every one out. Now, maybe you can think of another one that we didn't rule out. But you can look at the PNAS paper we, where we, because like the Markov model, you could say, well, you know, when you make the choice, then it changes the system. This, like, for example, here's an example of a, a change in the system of the Markov model. When you make a choice, let's say you choose that you think the dots are going on the right, that starts to bias your evidence accumulation. 
So now you start focusing more on evidence for the right and, and you discard the evidence for the left. That'll produce a change. But that that change, that's like um, what we call, um, what do you call that? Confirmation effect. It's kind of a confirmation. You made a choice, you said it's on the right. So now you try to look for confirming evidence. That explanation predicted the opposite of the results that we got. So that doesn't work. The interference effect we got, it was in the opposite direction. But anyway, there's that other explanations like that, but we tried to rule out a lot of them. Of course, you can always try to think of another one, but yeah. I mean, we, we can't, this is never gonna prove the, prove the Markov. You can't prove any theory to be true. In fact, all theories are wrong. But, um, but, but we like the quantum model. We think we have evidence for the quantum model because we, we designed these experiments before we looked at the data. So we made a priori predictions and the quantum model was supported. We were surprised. In fact, when we did these interference studies, we never thought we'd get interference because nobody thought you would get interference. Nobody, people working with the Markov models, when they asked for choice and confidence ratings, they never thought of anything about the choice interference with the, interfering with the confidence ratings. They, they thought they had no effect, but we studied it. We did, we, the quantum model predicted it. So we're, I think the advantage of the quantum model is we're, we're predicting things a priori. So like you could have a dynamic system, but the dynamic system doesn't have to operate. It doesn't have to oscillate. It could be, it could be monotonic or it could be oscillating. I mean, it could be either one, but we had to predict oscillation. So that's, that's my argument. That's a good question though. I mean, it's, that's a legitimate question. I mean, it, there's always alternative explanations. Um, hi, I have a question uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you sort of spoke to us in the beginning and maybe I missed this, but I was just wondering when you were talking about the differences between like a decision, like a preference decision um, versus like, a, is this moving right or left decision? Mm. Is there, like, do you see a difference in which type of model is, is the best for those? Is there any difference at all? Well, I mean, we've, we've, we've applied, we've applied the quantum model to both, both those types, you know, I mean, you know, so we found, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like we applied the quantum model to this perceptual dot mode. This is an evidence accumulation task here, but then the last one I just showed you with the, with the oscillation, that's a value-based decision-making. So we found evidence for the quantum model in both, both kinds of tasks. I think, but, but I think what, um, where the quantum model probably operates better is when there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, like if you have a clear preference decision, I mean, if you have a really strong preference, probably the Markov model is going to start working better. But if you have a really difficult preference decision, I think the quantum model might work better. Or if you have a really difficult evidence accumulation problem, like if the coherence is low, that's where the quantum model is working better. But if the coherence okay. is high, that's where the Markov model starts working better. That's what we're finding so far. Okay, so it's more about the uncertainty than the, than the type of the decision. Then. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jerome, I've got kind of a similar question with regard to the, the math. Um, mm -hmm. The weights in your open system, they, they were static and not time dependent, right? Right. So are they really operating off the amount of coherence in the system? No, yeah, so these weights are static. They don't change across time. But okay. the way this dynamic works, is so let's let's go back to this density here i mean this density that on a diagonal you have kind of like classical probabilities on the off diagonals you have like the um the quantum the quantum stuff you know the quantum amplitudes and what happens is is that uh it starts out you have you have off diagonal entries that makes this system in, in quantum computing they call it coherent the off diagonal entries are important for what they call coherence and it starts out coherent in a quantum, but but this 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 Markov part, this this Lindblad, it's called Lindblad in the quantum field, but it produces a Markov. It starts driving, it starts driving all the off diagonals to zero. So it's it slowly starts you know emptying out the off diagonals, and so it 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 diagonalizes it, what they we call diagonalizes this matrix. Starts out a full matrix with off diagonals, but then this thing decays all the off diagonals. It becomes diagonal. 
once this becomes diagonal, then it's classical. It's quant. I mean, it's it's classical Markov. So it starts off with off diagonals. It's called that's called a coherent quantum state, and then it's driven by this term to get rid of the diagon to get rid of the off diagonals, and it becomes diagonal, and it becomes more classical Markov. So like in quantum computing, this is what's causing the trouble. This is like the environmental environmental disturbances coming in. So this is this is what's the quantum state that they want to keep. They don't want this term here. They want to try to reduce this emphasis. They want to reduce this weight here because this makes the system decohere. But for us, this this captures the, um, the, the Markov part. So you start out oscillating and you kind of, the oscillation starts to dampen out. And so that's what, that's what we use this for. Yeah, anyway, yeah, so these are constant, but it's just the, the mechanics of this dynamic. It's, it, you know, so the changing from quantum regime to Markov regime is, is coming from the, the, bal the balance of these two, di two different kinds of dynamics. Okay, I think I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, hello, so thank you for your, for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a researcher interested in individual differences. And correct me if I'm wrong. So on one slide, you uh, put it that so seven out of nine subjects uh, prefer the quantum model. So which yeah. means that two of them prefer um, Markov. So yeah. I'm interested in, so there's any like individual differences. I think the majority of people may favor quantum, but it's like this any uh, individual trace that could predict which model people would choose. Uh, yeah, I mean, we got this in here too, like these are different participants right here. And some of the participants were actually best fit by the Markov model. And then so others are best fit by the quantum model. Like here's one fit by the Markov model. Here's one, here's one. So yeah, you get these individual differences. And, you know, now we we, we can, I'm not saying predict it, but we can capture that that individual difference could be this parameter omega right here. So if if I set if I set omega here to one, so this goes to zero, so this goes disappears, and so we just have this part of the model. It's pure Markov, and you get exactly exactly the same answer as a, as a random walk diffusion model. But if I set if I set omega to zero, then this becomes one then I get a pure Markov model. You know, so I think the individual difference would be in this omega parameter. Uh, and we've just started fitting this model. So uh, in fact, this, this data was the first time we tried to fit the, the open systems model. I think the, um, you know, the parameter turned out to be like, uh, this was like around point, like, as I recall, point 0.8 and this is point 0.2 for most. So it's like mostly Markov, and, but still a healthy part on the quantum. But I would put the individual difference here. But now why would some people be, yeah, I mean, it might reflect, some people are more like, um, you know, clear, let's say clear, really clear, maybe clear in their, in their, in their state, you know, st state of mind, clear. Where some people are, let, let's say more indeterminate, allow more indeterminate. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but you can be like a little bit more on, in some kind of an uncertain, indeterminate state where somebody has to be always in a determinate state. That could be an individual difference. I mean, some people don't like uncertainty, for example. They like to be sure about things. So in a, in a Markov model, you're, you're definitely in one state or the other, for example, you're clear. But in the quantum model, you're kind of fuzzy. You're, you have this kind of fuzzy superposition um, indeterminate state. So that could be, some people are more, you know, like call it fuzzy reasoners. I don't, not a bad thing, maybe, because quantum computing, they have to take care, they take advantage of that fuzzy reasoning. That's how they can speed up the computations. The, the superposition state is needed to um, do faster quantum computing. So not fuzzy is not, not necessarily bad, but it, when, when you're in a fuzzy reasoning state, it's kind of like you're, par you're thinking about hypotheses in parallel. So some, some way the quantum computer is, is speeding up calculations because it, it can compute hypotheses in parallel. And so this fuzzy state, you're you're, you're, you're maintaining many hypotheses simultaneously in a, in, a, in a sense, a kind of loose sense, but you're kind of in this fuzzy state. So it could be that kind of an individual difference. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Oh, you're fine. Uh, let's see, I think you 
spoke to this uh, just a second ago, uh, it, it sounded like you were saying there, there might be individual differences in the omega parameter. Right. Uh, and uh, so you could kind of elaborate on that more. Do you think you could have, uh, say, you know, basically regression style predictors of those individual differences in the omega parameter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the model has kind of the structure of a mixture model and yeah, mixture right. modeling, a typical thing you do is you've got kind of individual predictors of the kind of mixture probabilities such that kind of one person is much more likely to be in one class and another person is much more likely to be in a different class. And mm -hmm. you could kind of change the tuning of the, the mixture components uh, between the yeah. kind of the quantum dynamics and the, the, the Barkov dynamics. No, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I agree. Let, let me make a couple of points. Yeah, please. One, one, one point I want to address is a little bit, a little bit different than you're talking about. Then I'll come back to your point. But this model, it, it's kind of a mixture, but it's not like let's let's go back to this picture. It's not a mixture in a sense that some proportion of people are doing this, and then some proportion of people are doing that, and you average the two. Or, or let's say, on some trials, the subjects doing mark pure Markov. On other trials, the subject's doing pure quantum, and we've averaged across trials. That's not what the model's doing. In fact, that, that model would continue to oscillate too. I mean, this wouldn't produce any oscillation, but this would continue oscillating. We're getting dampening. So this mixture is, is not a mixture of like, well, sometimes you do this and sometimes you do that. This is like a mixture of two different dynamics. You know, so it's, it's a new dynamic that's a mixture of two dynamics. Yeah. But yeah, it would be um, kind of interesting. Like if we're thinking about a mega, like let's say a person who likes is um you know comfortable with uncertainty or indefiniteness or you know allowing possibilities to exist in parallel you know if we had like individual difference measures we could try to use those individual difference measures to try to predict omega of course we haven't done that yet because this is all pretty new but yeah. but there might be a lot of individual differences that could predict this so we have like a regression model that predicts omega and that would allow us to predict you know an individual dynamics better th rather than just fitting the parameter to them. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I know you said that you haven't done that, but it, were you to start researching that, what do you think the information in your data would be that would drive good estimation of those individual difference parameters? So would it simply be more trials? Would it be certain types of trial, uh, certain ta types of tasks or, or what? Because often you can think of a mixture model quite easily, but the the rubber meets the road when you try to estimate it and you end up given a hundred items, you know, and each one takes two minutes and uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So, so it's not, it's not feasible in practice. What what do you think would drive this? Well, I think that um, it, to to really get a good estimate of these omegas, you first of all you need to have an experiment where you you can maybe sh reveal some kind of quantum effects. Like if, you know, if I just did a, we have fit just plain old choice response time data. If we fit plain old choice response time data, you know, like a typical experiment, um, we're not gonna see the quantum effect. You know, you, 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 the extra parameter right here is not gonna be, well, the extra parameter right here is not gonna be needed. You know, we could probably just do fine. Well, we, we, have, fit a, we have compared a fit of a pure quantum model to, to a, a pure Markov model for choice response time. And actually the, um, the pure Markov model when I did it, did a little bit better than the quantum model for predicting response time. But anyway, so I think, you know, if you just do a simple, choice response time experiment, you're not even gonna get this estimate because you, won't, you probably won't need it. So you, you're gonna to have to do an experiment that, or you're gonna to have to collect data where you, you're kind of, kind of exposing these quantum effects and then you can start estimating this parameter. So it might not just be <clears throat> sufficient to add lots of trials or things like that. It might be more important to make sure you, um, you kind of have the conditions for exposing what, what are uniquely quantum aspects, you know, without that, you're not probably, you probably won't need the quantum model. So we, you know, we deliberately design experiments where we kind of try to s discover, you know, that we predict these quantum effects. And that's where, that, that's where the quantum model will shine. If we didn't deliberately design in these conditions, we probably wouldn't get strong evidence for the quantum model.
that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question about transitions, uh, phase transitions? Uh, so when you're starting in the quantum to a uh, going from the quantum like system to the Markov system, which of the parameters do you think is driving that transition? That the transition is it a omega, or do you think it is a gamma here? Yeah, no, it's it's the gammas and these. It's the it's the gamma. Now the gamma, like this gamma right here, is your Markov transition probability. So basically, this is going to be the probability you go from from state J to state I. So that's the Markov transition probability. And, and and these things, this thing, this complicated thing is, I know it looks like a mess, but that's called the Lindblad operator. This is this thing is what's driving the off diagonals to zero. And so it's not the omega. Well, of course, if omega is zero, you won't have this. But if you get your fixed omega, this is over time making the off diagonals go to zero, which changes it from quantum to Markov. When it, when it, when this becomes diagonal matrix, then it's classical Markov. So this it's this these Lindblad operators that are dampening out the off diagonals. This is called these are called decoherence terms in in quantum computing. Anyway, that's the this is the one that's doing that's changing the regime. This one right here. And have you looked at what that looks like at the transition? What how those parameters behave when at the phase transition? It's it's not like a it's not like an abrupt transition. It's more of a gradual transition. So it's you can't you know, I mean, yeah. There's no like it's not a jump in the system or anything like that. It's more it's it's becoming more. It's starting out quantum like, and then becomes more Markov like. It, eventually, it becomes pure Markov at the end. But it's it's more of a gradual change. So there's no abrupt change. Now you we could look at early in the. You know. If we looked at early in the decision process where it's more in the Markov, uh, quantum area versus we could look at later in the process where it's more in the Markov area, you know, if we then, if, you know, we could look at the parameters at the early stage or later stage. And, and uh, but, but, you know, we think all these, these parameters are always operating all the time. They're not just turning on or turning off at different stages. They're the omega is constant. This is called a Hamiltonian. <clears throat> but this is this is constant. Of course, the, the dynamics in the uh, this row right here. This is the, where the dynamic is. These are constant. These are constant. So all these other things are constant across trials, and it's this operator that's changing the dynamics from into changing the dynamics in the Markov. Thank you. All right. So I think we should probably end here. Uh, okay. It's already a few minutes after twelve. Uh, that was. Probably some of the most uh, involved discussion that we've had with, with the speaker for the program. So that, that was great. So join me in, uh, if you, a few of you can unmute and uh, just give one more round of applause to, to Jerome. Thank you. Um, if you have more questions, you can get in touch with him uh, directly. Maybe some of you have meetings already with Jerome. Uh, Jerome, just, just to remind you, you have uh, another 25 minutes before your next meeting, and then you have yeah. a half an hour. Or actually, an hour break between 1:30 and 2:30 later. Uh, One other thing is, like, if you if you get interested in this quantum cognition, we have a book, so you can study. It's kind of a you know inter, you know it's a it's a it's a design to teach you all, all the ideas of quantum cognition. So you might, if you like, you might take a look at that book. Okay, so Wonderful. all righty, I'll take a break and then I'll get back. Sounds good. Bye everybody. Bye bye.